Good evening. I'm going to encourage everyone to take a seat, especially the people at the buffet. <laughs> um, good evening. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Nomi Stolzenberg, and I'm here to welcome everyone on behalf of the four sponsoring institutions that have come together to bring tonight's event and the ensuing conference over the next couple of days. Um, that includes Harvard Law School, our host institution, UCLA's Williams Institute, headed by Brad Sears, the ACLU, and my home institution, the University of Southern California, in particular USC Center for Law, History, and Culture, which together with USC's Center for Religion and Civic Culture, recently launched a new program on religious accommodation. That's a lot of sponsors. Um, and it bespeaks the spirit of collaboration that defines this event. In that spirit, I want to single out the four individuals with whom I've been collaborating for, I think it's a full year, to organize and conceptualize this event. Nan Hunter, professor of law at Georgetown. Doug Nijame, professor of law at UC Irvine Law School. Louise Melling, deputy legal director of the ACLU. And Mark Tushnet, professor of law here at Harvard Law School, whose landmark 1988 article on the then emerging principle of religious accommodation really serves as the inspiration for tonight's panel discussion. I also want to single out for thanks Ben Sears and Ethan Thomas and Julie Vakoch, who took responsibility for running and promoting this event and especially to Dean Martha Minow, without whose support from the very beginning, and by that I mean both material and spiritual support, <laughs> none of this would have been possible. And I have to say, as I was thinking about uh, making this welcome, I was reflecting back on my years as a student here when I was one of Dean Minow's First students, pretty close. Um, and I have to say, it's really clear to me that for me personally, this conference presents the fruition of ideas that I first began thinking about when Dean Minna was my teacher. And her teaching and writing on the subject of accommodating difference has certainly shaped my own thinking, and I think it's really shaped this conference in many more ways than I can express. So in closing, before I hand the reins to Dean Minow, um, just one last thought about the spirit of collaboration. Again, speaking for myself, I can say, having been at this for 25 years, which I think was when I graduated here, I have never been involved in an academic event with such political immediacy and urgency. I mean, the timing, as Nancy Rosenblum said, is kind of heaven sent, or <laughs> it's certainly remarkable timing. Um, and I've also, I dare to say, I don't think I've ever been part of an academic gathering with such a broad spectrum of positions represented. And I want to say, as we start, the disagreements among us are profound. The issues at stake are serious, and the conflict is intense. But so too is our commitment to the spirit of collaboration and to talking across differences. After all, that is the topic of this conference. Um, so without further ado, I want to introduce the woman who literally wrote the book on accommodating difference, <laughs> Dean Martha Minow. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, good afternoon, and uh, Nomi, uh, that was really very beautiful, and I'm going to now be um, happy for the rest of my life, I think, because of that particular introduction. Uh, it is uh, it, uh, really Nomi's phone call that made this conference happen, and Nomi said, don't you think we could do something on this? And, um, and from that evolved, I think, a just terrific collaboration, and I want to echo her thanks as well. Uh, we're living in an interesting time. <laughs> We're living in a time in this country and in the world. Um, I, I come to the topic that we will be dealing with very personally. Um, I, it's because I'm a middle child, I think. Is, uh, but, but, but seriously, I'm, I consider myself a religious person, and I consider myself someone who um, came to law school to work on civil rights. Uh, and the collision between those commitments um, has been challenging, and it gets more challenging, not less challenging. Um, the research and scholarship of many people who are here and others uh, who are considering the subject, I think, offers the possibility for a better discussion about the issues than we see in the public debates, and frankly, a better discussion than we see in the courts. Um, I think that when we first started talking about this subject, we thought it would be timely. We had no idea quite exactly how timely it is. Um, and it, it is my own personal commitment as the dean of this institution to try to make sure that we provide a forum for the kind of respectful, engaged, rigorous discussions and debate across really different points of view where maybe, again, we can model something that's a little bit better than what we see in the public discourse. And I am sure that we will see that happen here today. So I want to thank you all for your participation. And I'm going to uh, sit down and join the panel. Well, great. So uh, I'm Jack Rako from Stanford. And it's uh, truly my great honor to have been asked to uh, chair this first panel. My, my own original intention was just to be invited to the conference uh, so I could kind of come and learn some things that I want to find out more about. But uh, thanks to Nomi and Martha and Mark and whoever else cooperating in this, I've, I've been put in what I think is the truly admirable position of being able to kind of preside over uh, a truly esteemed and distinguished group of uh, you know friends and colleagues. Uh, and I think what we're going to try to do under the general title of uh, accommodation emergent is to speak, I think in, um, I don't want to say in fairly broad terms, but to uh, try to address an array of issues that we hope will you know help to shape some of the discourse that will unfold today and tomorrow and uh, on into Saturday. And I think uh, what we've decided to do is uh, to ask for fairly short presentations up front, meaning um, everyone has uh, his, or her, his or her own topic that uh, each person wants to stress. So I think we'll try to do that in kind of 10 to 12 minutes per person. And then I'd like to see what kind of uh, original exchanges we can have among the panelists. We haven't planned this in advance, so that will have to be somewhat spontaneous. Uh, and then I think we'll try to open things up. And I hope that'll you know, help to provide a, a good model for the conference as a whole. Um, this is one of those occasions where one really doesn't need to introduce the panelists who would be wholly superfluous and we actually they're wonderful self-written introductions uh, of everyone in you know in the program but just suffice to say that uh, you know we'll, we'll we'll start we'll start with uh, Mark Tushnet who's uh, whose article on accommodation from a quarter century ago uh, evidently assembles to the whole field um, next to speak will be my friend and colleague Michael McConnell from Stanford, who's approached this issue and in in, or these issues in a number of different capacities as a, uh, as a professor and, of course, as a judge on the Tenth Circuit, though in its pre Hobby Lobby days, and of course also as a very active advocate in the religion clause litigation. Uh, Martha, who certainly needs no introduction at Harvard Law School as its as its presiding dean, but obviously. Uh, extremely distinguished in terms of the area of uh, discrimination, and Louise, who comes to us fresh from the battlefield uh, as a very active litigator in, you know, in, in religion clause subjects. Uh, so without further ado, um, I'll turn it over to Mark, and I'll, you know, I'll try to subtly suggest when we ought to move on to the next speaker. So. <laughs> Give me a nudge. Um, so the first thing I want to do <clears throat> is to uh, just uh, reframe the, the uh, uh, presentation of the overall idea of the conference. Uh, it, it was <laughs> not, it, my article was 25 years ago, so that's convenient, but it was a response to an article that Mike McConnell ha had published a couple of years earlier. Response isn't the right word, a reaction to uh, his uh, argument, and, and he had actually set out the idea of accommodation of religion as a, an overarching theme, 
in understanding the uh, religion clauses, and, and I played off what he had developed uh, in a, as the title of my article uh, indicated, a, a more skeptical way uh, than his. Uh, but it's really, you know, it's only the happenstance of 25 years that led to the framing with, with my article. I want to make three or four points, probably only three uh, in the time available. <clears throat> First, about the background of the idea of accommodation religion, uh, of the idea. Second, about the political background against which the idea emerged and against it, which is now playing out. And then third, some analytical difficulties with the idea. If time permits, I have what I think of as a theological point, but <laughs> I may not be able to make that. So on the background of the, the idea, in, in a McConnell's article in 1985, uh, he said uh, early on, accommodation is a practice undertaken specifically for the purpose of facilitating the free exercise of religion. Uh, he said that in the context of uh, an interpretive approach to the religion clauses taken together, that taken together, their goal was to promote religious liberty. <clears throat> now, he was responding to, I believe, I mean, I, he can speak for himself, but uh, uh, I believe he was responding to a background in which there were three things uh, that I would identify. First, a commonly asserted uh, tension between the free exercise principle and the principle of non-establishment. Um, uh, second, uh, one effort at resolving that asserted tension, uh, which was to eliminate the tension or resolve it uh, by a principle of strict separation of, uh, of church and state, the effect of which was to um, give the non-establishment principle a very strong interpretation and the free exercise principle a relatively weak one. <clears throat> there was also rattling around uh, uh, an idea that uh, didn't come to, well, had been articulated fully by Philip <coughs> Curland, uh, but was not really um, taken up by the courts or uh, other commentators until after both he and I wrote our articles. Uh, and his approach was an approach of uh, facial neutrality. Uh, uh, you would resolve attention by saying that uh, all legislation that was facially neutral with respect to religion was constitutionally permissible no matter what its effects were, either in advancing religious interests or in inhibiting religious liberty. Uh, at the time I wrote, I should note, I was attracted to Curlin's approach. I later uh, changed my views, uh, uh, but that's uh, which I may get to. So uh, McConnell offered a resolution that would dis dissolve the tension. Uh, the policy space dealing with religion would be occupied by what I ended up calling permissible accommodations and mandatory accommodations. And uh, his idea was that permissible accommodations, again, practices undertaken for the purpose of facilitating free exercise, um, were not, permissible accommodations were not in conflict with the non-establishment principle, and mandatory ones were required by the free exercise principle. And, both of these kinds of accommodation uh, would advance uh, religious liberty. Now, one problem with his conceptualization was that it was unclear uh, what space there was for application of the non-establishment principle, uh, because virtually everything, and I think maybe everything, uh, you could describe as violating some, non some notion of non-establishment, could be re-described as an accommodation. Uh, in my article, it's actually rhetorically difficult to make that point uh, uh, for reasons that I'll indicate in just a moment, but in my article, I use the example of organized teacher-led school prayer, which I laid out the argument for conceptualizing that as a permissible accommodation of religion uh, aimed at facilitating religious liberty. Now, that's sort of, in that version, it's a reductio argument, and like all reductio arguments, if people like, uh, it's predicated on the idea that that's just not an acceptable outcome, but if you thought that it was an acceptable outcome, then you wouldn't have trouble with uh, McConnell's approach. So 
my guess is that if anyone offered me an example of what he or she regarded as a clear non-establishment violation, no matter what it was, that is, I would take from the person in front of me the idea of non-establishment, uh, I could re-describe it uh, as an accommodation in, in McConnell's terms. Um, so, so one of the nervousnesses that I expressed in my article was that his uh, approach might not uh, actually leave space for the free exercise, for the non-establishment principle. Again, if strict separation didn't leave much space for free exercise, his might not leave much space for non-establishment. I'm going to return in my third point to another difficulty, which I'll just preview briefly, a form of sect preference that's likely to occur in the actual administration of an accommodation regime. That's not an analytic point. It's not a criticism of the concept of accommodation, but it's a practical institutional point. Okay. Second uh, topic, the political setting in which the idea of accommodation uh, emerged. At the time McConnell wrote, uh, the issues that he was dealing with arose from the operation of what I will describe as government programs associated with the progressive and New Deal eras, uh, the latter defined to cover some aspects of, of the great society. Think, think sort of generally welfare state programs, public education, and the like. <clears throat> now, as a political matter, by the time these issues uh, surfaced, Political support for those programs was quite widespread. Uh, there was quite general support for them, but in political scientists' terms, that meant that the support was, as they would put it, diffuse, whereas claims for accommodation were, in general, made by focused or discrete groups. Uh, and in a standard story of how politics in that kind of setting works out, focus groups prevail over diffuse ones. Um, that, that was what gave the accommodation principle some uh, political force. And it's, I think it's notable that, uh, that the limits of accommodation in practice occurred in the setting of voucher programs where the opposition was focused rather than diffuse, roughly speaking, uh, public school teachers and their unions. Uh, in terms of the theme of, the conf of this conference, public, the title actually uh, captures the different political setting, a religious accommodation in the age of civil rights. The issues of accommodation arise in co connection with non-discrimination policies that have, again, to use the same term that I used earlier, focused beneficiaries, which makes the conflict more intense. Uh, the focused beneficiaries of the general programs are intensely uh, committed to them, and the focused people who are burdened by the programs are intensely uh, uh, opposed to them. Uh, and the outcome of those kinds of things, that kind of struggle is, uh, political scientists would say, uh, indeterminate, not systematically uh, determined. But what it does mean is that the conflict will, will seem and be more severe today than it was in the 1980s when the conflicts arose in connection with, again, these welfare state programs. Uh, now, the third point, uh, right, and I'm going to run out of time, so uh, is um, uh, some problems with accommodation as a general principle. And I want to begin with what I would characterize as my tweaks to uh, McConnell's uh, argument. Um, the, the distinction which he acknowledged, I just gave labels to, between mandatory and permissible accommodations. Uh, the, the Smith case sharply narrowed the category of mandatory accommodations in a way consistent with uh, Curlin's facial neutrality approach. Um, the effect of that was to place more pressure on the category of permiss permissible accommodations. But roughly speaking, if you weren't going to be able to generate mandatory accommodations, you're going to want to try to generate more permissible ones. Uh, and in retrospect, or post-Smith, I think, uh, I, I know that I should, this should have distinguished between what I would now call something like focused permissible accommodations and general 
permissible accommodation. The, the contrast is between the peyote exemption on the federal statute books or the yarmulke exemption after Goldman and Weinberger. On the one side, that's a focused accommodation with uh, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, uh, even post-Bernie. Um, now, even with respect to focused accommodations, there are some problems mostly about sect preference. Uh, that is, as Justice Scalia argued, or I would say acknowledged in Smith, focused accommodations are likely to be available to groups with sufficient political clout and not to others. I think there might be ways of dealing with that objection uh, by offering a kind of political analysis. Uh, today, I think the issues that we're dealing with arise primarily in connection with general permissible accommodations uh, like uh, RIFRA. And here, it, even if the political process was a constraint on focused um, uh, accommodations, uh, I think uh, it might not work effectively or as effectively in connection with general ones because at the moment of adoption, when RIFR was adopted, uh, the policy impairments that accommodations will work are unknown, uh, which means that the opponents of general accommodations are, once again, a diffuse group. And, uh, uh, and, and I've sort of talked about what happens under those circumstances. On the doctrinal level, uh, general uh, accommodations raise many, maybe even all, of the concerns that Justice Scalia voiced in Smith with respect to mandatory accommodations. Comparison of incommensurables, uh, inevitable evaluation of the weight and not merely the sincerity uh, of belief. Uh, to the point where in Smith, I think, he can be read as suggesting that mandatory accommodations were bothersome uh, because they imposed on the courts a task for which they were institutionally unsuited, a sort of quasi-Article III point. I don't want to say that he made an Article III argument against RIFRA, but he was working in the domain of uh, institutional competence. Uh, and that suggests that for institutional rather than analytic reasons, uh, the courts might want to consider uh, construing general permissible accommodations narrowly in a manner akin to the de minimis standard uh, for Title VII exemptions, or Title whatever it is exemptions, in TWA and Hardison. Um, I'm out of time, so I will not try to make my theological point, but if anybody <laughs> wants to ask me about it, uh, <laughs> when we're talk standing around talking, not, uh, I'd be happy to raise it. Well, we'll just say he won't make it yet. <laughs> <laughs> Michael? Uh, if you don't mind uh, my standing up, it's easier. Um, I'm going... I'm going to cover some of the same territory that Mark was just uh, talking about, but I want to talk a, a little bit more as a lawyer in terms of, of doctrine and uh, with a little review of where we've been and then where I think we are uh, uh, today. Uh, so the question of accommodation is nothing new. There have been accommodations of religion, you know, all the way to the founding and e uh, even before uh, Perhaps not so many in a largely Protestant America, but there were some uh, having to do with uh, 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 Sabbath laws that uh, impinged upon Jewish businesses, with uh, various sects that could not uh, either take oaths or serve on juries, uh, and the most important and most perennial being uh, military conscription. Uh, where there's actually a, de a, a debate during the Bill of Rights debate as to whether there should be a specific uh, exemption uh, from military service for uh, uh, conscientious objectors. Um, during most of this early period, the first 100 or 150 years of the Republic, it never occurred to anyone that the Establishment Clause uh, would have anything to do with this. And I think the main reason for that is that accommodations always come in the form of uh, exceptions from uh, the generally applicable law. So you have a, a general law that establishes one kind of norm or principle or policy, and the accommodation uh, is, a, is an accommodation for dissenters from that. That doesn't look very much like an establishment because 
establishment is about majoritarian uh, imposition of religious norms. It's not about allowing religious minorities to be able to uh, dissent from and operate differently from uh, the majoritarian norm. And so I, I think it just simply didn't occur to anyone for a very long time that uh, establishment had anything uh, uh, to do with it. Uh, by the time that uh, Martha Minow and Dean Minow and I were both law clerks uh, in the same year, uh, and, and things were different by then, and there was a case, uh, Thomas versus Review Board, uh, it's, it's really a, a repeat of Sherbert against Werner, uh, but uh, Justice Rehnquist wrote a prescient and I think really important dissent. He was the sole dissenter, and his dissent pointed out that the free exercise doctrine of that time, Sherbert and Yoder, which required a compelling governmental interest if uh, there was if government policy impinged upon the free exercise of religion, looked like it was in flat out contradiction to the establishment cause test of that time, which was the lim the three part. Uh, Lemon versus Kurtzman uh, test, and he went through each of the three prongs of Lemon and showed how, uh, by sort of uh, by definition, <laughs> religious accommodations would violate all three. And he said we should get rid of both. Well, I said he was prescient because uh, we've gotten rid of both, and it's interesting to see what's come up in their uh, uh, in their stead. Well, the first shoe to drop was uh, Employment Division against Smith, which jettisoned the uh, Sherbert and Werner uh, and uh, Yoder uh, free exercise test, saying that under most circumstances, at least, uh, uh, there could be no free exercise uh, challenge to a neutral law of general uh, applicability. Um, many of us thought that that was going to be quite a, uh, a dramatic uh, change, and you know, many people thought it would be a disaster. Most of the members of Congress seemed to think it was going to be a disaster, and it was. Uh, uh, and Congress passed the Religious Freedom uh, Restoration Act. Well, my own view on this at the time was the, the a statute. Well, you know, that's kind of weak tea. I'd rather have the real thing. I'd really rather have the Constitution on my side than the statute. Um, I think I was wrong about that because I actually think that the combination of Smith and RIFRA, where RIFRA applies to federal government action and then uh, with uh, the Religious uh, uh, Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act to some action of state and local governments, um, I think the combination of Smith and RIFRA actually uh, uh, made uh, accommodations, court-ordered accommodations, easier to get, uh, and uh, uh, because those democratic objections to an activist uh, uh, interpretation of the First Amendment were laid aside. What, what Mark Tushnet <laughs> interprets as Article Three problems that Scalia identifies, I think, are democratic problems. That what bothered Scalia was the idea that judges took it upon themselves to do this aggressive and highly subjective uh, determination of free exercise rights. But once Congress said, that's really what we want you to do, then those democratic objections went away. And so o the Ocentro uh, uh, versus Gonzalez case is an almost complete rerun of Smith, and it comes out unanimous. The entire court uh, comes out to protect the use of the psychedelic uh, uh, drug by a small uh, religious uh, minority. And, and, and there were academics who thought that uh, RIFRA, in addition to its federalism problems, which were uh, uh, accepted in, in, the, in the Bernie case, some academics thought that there was an establishment clause problem with RIFRA, coming back to some of those very sort of Lemon versus Kurtzman uh, type arguments that Justice Rehnquist had raised back in the Thomas uh, case. Uh, but the Supreme Court wasn't buying it uh, in 2005 in Cutter versus Wilkinson in a case involving the R RLUPA rather than RIFRA, unanimous Supreme Court decision written by none other than Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, dismissing the, uh, uh, the Establishment Clause challenge, completely dismissing the core of the old lemon point uh, 
which was that accommodations are inherently establishments because they benefit religion in a way that they don't benefit comparable secular activities. That point is simply flatly rejected. Uh, and then uh, the court uh, uh, substitutes uh, some other considerations that I want to talk about in, in just a moment. Um, and then after that, again, another surprisingly unanimous nine to nothing decision just a few years ago in the Hosanna Tabor uh, uh, case. Uh, a remarkable case for a number of reasons. Uh, 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 first of all, it uh, 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 unanimous and uh, unanimously holding that the Civil Rights Acts of uh, of Title VII are unconstitutional as applied to religious institutions. Um, this is a conference about the interplay between civil rights laws and religious accommodation, and uh, so far it's been religious accommodation one and civil rights laws zero, uh, or maybe we want to say nine, and, 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 and especially remarkable because the court said uh, that the religious claimant wins constitutionally, not just under RFRA, but constitutionally, and under both the free exercise clause and the establishment clause. So that's double-barreled, right? And they did this in the face of a brief from the Department of Justice, which took a very strong line, saying that uh, uh, that it was uh, uh, that the uh, uh, First Amendment principles did not provide any special protection for religious institutions at all. A position which the court said unanimously uh, was uh, far-fetched. Interesting that. Elena Kagan, who had been Solicitor General not long before, joined in this unanimous opinion condemning the Justice Department's position in pretty strong uh, uh, terms. So it's hard to say that Smith was in the long run much of a, uh, of a setback uh, for the cause of free exercise uh, protection. But let me look then at the considerations in uh, Cutter versus Wilkinson, which I think are doctrinally where we are. First of all, I said uh, there were two shoes that dropped, so the, the, the free exercise test was eliminated in Smith, uh, but Cutter explicitly uh, rejects the uh, lemon test in uh, footnote six. Um, comments on the, on the Lemon argument against the, uh, the statute and says, we resolve this case on other grounds. Now, footnote, I was a, an inferior court judge and this sort of thing that drives inferior court judges crazy because what does that mean? Uh, they get to resolve it on some other ground, but are the lower courts, what, what's, what are they supposed to do? Is the lemon test still a test? Or, you know, get, please let us know what the law is. It's, this is. They say they're not an error-correcting court. That means they ought to give us some explanation for where we stand. But I, you know, I interpret this as saying, at least in the context of accommodation, uh, that the lemon test and all the, the, the three prongs that Rehnquist talked about way back in Thomas, that that's not on the table anymore. Instead, uh, Justice Ginsburg, in that opinion, uh, points to three uh, other factors that she says, the, the way she puts it, uh, is that, uh, that, that, that this, these three factors um, uh, make the establishment, make the statute compatible with the Establishment Clause. Now, it's not clear that she's saying that, the, that it would be unconstitutional in the absence of these three, so we have to be a little bit careful. There's some ambiguity in the opinion, but nonetheless, what are they? Uh, the first is that the statute must, and I quote, allevi it alleviates exceptional government-created burdens on private religious exercise. Now, this uh, there's a history to this language. Uh, and every, it, it goes back indeed to uh, uh, Justice Rehnquist's uh, Thomas uh, dissent in which uh, he told us that in his view, the, um, uh, let me read you his language, he said that uh, governmental assistance which does not have the effect of quote, inducing religious belief, but instead merely accommodates, 
in quotes, or implements an independent religious choice does not impermissibly uh, involve the government in violation of the Establishment Clause. So this is essentially Rehnquist's idea, but with slightly different language, and in particular, where did the, where did the adjective exceptional come from? Uh, it's, it comes from no prior decision. Prior decisions discussing this concept sometimes said, Justice Brennan's language, that there has to have been a significant burden on uh, the practice of religion. Sometimes uh, Justice O'Connor's formulation had no adjective at all. Uh, when Congress got around to passing RIFRA, and you would think that that might be, have some uh, weight in this area, Congress used the adjective substantial. But suddenly, here's this word exceptional. Uh, I don't know whether to read much into that or not. But it does look as though perhaps Justice Ginsburg is interested in a, in a slightly higher uh, 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 threshold here. Uh, but since the case didn't involve any such questions, uh, we don't really know. And I guess technically, uh, the use of that word would be a dictum. Um, the, uh, uh, the third of, the, uh, of these considerations is that the statute must um, will be administered neutrally among different faiths, uh, and citing the curious Joel decision as an example of an accommodation that was not neutral. That was an accommodation specifically for one uh, for one uh, small uh, uh, Hasidic Jewish uh, sect. Uh, I'm not quite sure what this means in general. It uh, it um, makes a great deal of sense because there's a strong principle uh, that under the that uh, all religions have to have an equal liberty. That the uh, de denominational discrimination is one of the most fundamentally forbidden uh, things under the First Amendment. Uh, but I do wonder what about all those targeted. Uh, uh, accommodations that Mark is talking about, are they just all unconstitutional because each of them is written to accommodate a particular religious problem? If it's an exemption from kosher, for kosher slaughterhouses, from meatpacking regulations, you know, that's going to benefit one sect. If it's, a, if it's a military conscription exemption, it has to do with pacifism. At, uh, you know, what a, 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 so, but I don't, the opinion is quite ambivalent about this. It cites Curious Joel, but it also cites the statute that Congress passed overruling the result in Goldman against Weinberger. This allows Jewish officers and, and, uh, uh, and soldiers to wear the yarmulke as part of their uniform. Uh, that looks like a pretty targeted accommodation, and the court cites that with approval. So I, I identify that as, as another ambiguity that uh, is going to have to be litigated uh, in the future. Now, I left the second consideration to the last because it's gotten a great deal of attention recently, including in some very interesting articles by some folks uh, uh, in the room with us today, and they may be planning to talk about it uh, uh, tomorrow. And that has to do with the effect on uh, non-beneficiaries from the grant of an accommodation. And this is what uh, the court says uh, in Cutter, that the, uh, the statute alleviate, uh, that it, I'm sorry, um, properly applied, courts must take adequate account of the burdens a requested accommodation may impose on non-beneficiaries citing uh, a state of Thornton versus Caldor, which is a case which had been struck down uh, the other way. So um, this is uh, quite an interesting idea. It, too, has a history. Uh, there had been uh, comments about effects upon non-beneficiaries, not just in Caldor, but also in the Texas Monthly decision. Uh, and certainly, it was always a consideration in free exercise cases before RIFRA. Uh, it, James Madison, when he was commenting on the limits of free exercise, says that free exercise would, would extend uh, up until the point of violating, quote, private rights or the public peace. So private rights do seem to have something to do with the appropriate limits on accommodation. But exactly what? Now, 
if I read some of the recent scholarship, uh, there is an argument that uh, there can be no burdens at all, at least upon identifiable uh, and other identifiable individuals. Maybe burdens can be borne by the taxpayers or the government as a whole, but not upon uh, particular uh, identifiable uh, individuals. Um, I think that goes too far. Certainly it goes farther than Justice Ginsburg did in Cutter, because she doesn't say no burdens on non-beneficiaries. She says that the statute must take an adequate account of the burdens on non-beneficiaries. And But what is an adequate account? Uh, I, this is something obviously is going to be left for successive, you know, for future litigation. I identify it as one of those doctrinal points that will probably be uh, arguing in court for the next 20 years or so. But adequate, but I do want to say a few things about it. Um, this, this may be an adequate account up to this point. Is this the, uh, is that my 12? More. Oh, you didn't give me my 10 minute warning. Um, two or three more sentences. One is that uh, this, this limitation will never apply to RIFRA or similar statutes that allow uh, for a balancing between the free exercise uh, uh, clause and the government's compelling interest because that will always involve uh, and taking an account of those other interests. So it's only going to apply uh, to targeted uh, 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 free exercise exemptions that don't involve that involve a, a, a legislative judgment about uh, uh, about the weight on the other side rather than a judicial judgment, and I think that it will that these that this argument can only be brought on an as applied basis against one of those rather than a facial basis because there are always going to be numerous perfectly legitimate uh, applications of those. Uh, of those statutes. So I think it'll only be as applied, and then I'm going to sit down. But it also raises the very difficult issue of, of how to define a burden in the context of the regulatory state when the very claimed free exercise violation is the shift of a burden from another identifiable individual onto the free exercise claimant. That is, of course, a description of the Hobby Lobby case. Thank you. <laughs> Dean Minow. Well, first I'm going to do a professor type thing. If there's an empty seat next to you, raise your hand so that the people sitting in the back can find a place to sit. Thank you very much. So I majored in history as an undergraduate, and I had no idea that I would then spend the rest of my life wondering how do historians write about anything because the, I can't explain the history that I lived through. So Jack, <laughs> with indulgences, uh, I'm gonna try to tell the history that I understand about the, the accommodation issues in the age of, the civil, of civil rights, um, how accommodation emerged, but also why it's such a problem now. And this is pretty superficial, but I have a you know, limited mind because I have to hold budgets in my head these days. So. I, you know, it, 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 at this point in American history, we have a legal system that produces different treatment for discrimination by religious groups. And at the moment, I'm going to stick with that. I'm going to put aside corporations that may be held by a religious owner, um, depending on whether the claims arise in the context of race, gender, or sexual orientation. We have different answers. Now, how did that come to pass? That seems to me a puzzle. It seems to be, um, just to understate it, the, the, the case that religious groups risk losing their tax-exempt status if they discriminate on the basis of race. They cannot discriminate on the basis of race. You can't do that. Religiously managed schools, however, can discriminate on the basis of pregnancy and employment, even though there's gender equality statutes, gender equality constitutional basis. And Courts and legislatures permit discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation by religious organizations every time it comes up. So how did this come to pass? Well, I think it's about the relative power and success of social movements. I don't think it, I don't have a doctrinal explanation. I try to look at the doctrine. I wish I could take Michael's class and Mark's class and maybe it would all come clear to me. 
But I don't quite understand the doctrinal difference. Yes, there are different levels of constitutional scrutiny if we're using equal protection. Some of the cases we're dealing with federal statutes, some with state statutes, some with uh, local ordinances. Um, and sometimes we're dealing with subsidies and sometimes we're dealing with accommodations that don't uh, look like subsidies. But let's just take an example of the Bob Jones case. So, you know, I think for anyone who doesn't know the story of that case, Bob Jones University, um, which has a uh, religious affiliation, um, had a rule, had a practice uh, that actually at the time of the controversy forbade um, uh, couples, romantic couples, uh, or dating across a racial line. And the Internal Revenue Service uh, confronting this issue at first thought it had no power to address it and then later decided that it uh, did and said that the tax exempt status of this university would be withheld. The Supreme Court actually ultimately um, upheld the IRS ruling. Um, and it became a controversy for some time to come. And this is all interpretation of a regulation. It's all interpretation of whether or not the agency could deny tax exempt status um, and reject the religious rationale offered by the university. But it was a source of such contention that when it was applied to local private religious schools, it continued to be an issue for about 10, 15 years. And now it's not an issue. Indeed, it became such a symbol of ongoing conflict that during the 2000 presidential campaign, George W. Bush tried to recover from his primary defeat in New Hampshire, anybody remember that? By speaking at Bob Jones University. That was, as, and tried to align himself with evangelical Christianity and political conservatism, and then the media brought up the history about this past and exposed that the university still in, had in place a policy forbidding interracial dating. At which point the critics attacked candidate Bush for condoning the institution and its policy. And a month into it, the university announced a change in its policy. Uh, and candidate Bush said he was wrong not to have denounced the policy. Something happened. Uh, and in the past few years, um, it's become even this exact story had affected the fortunes of Senator Trent Lott, who became under criticism for his remarks, um, honoring Strom Thurmond. Because when he honored Strom Thurmond, the pro-segregationist, uh, and he actually um, then had to face critics who pointed to Lott had written a brief supporting Bob Jones' tax exemption. So this is now decades later, people looking back and saying, look what you did then. At the time, not particularly controversial. It became so controversial that it really, I think, uh, will continue to, uh, to follow Trent Lott forever. The issue came up during the confirmation hearings for Chief Justice John Roberts. He said explicitly, I was not involved in the case. He was pressed for his view. You know what senators do. They say, what do you think about this case? And you know what candidates to the Supreme Court do, nominees? They say, I can't say anything about this because an issue like that might come before me, right? Don't we know that? That is not what Chief Justice Roberts said. He did not decline to answer. Instead, he unequivocally answered that he disagreed with the Reagan administration's effort to grant the tax exemption. Something happened. Now, that history captures something that happened in this country about the consensus about racial discrimination. It wasn't there at the time of the case. It's there now. We're at a different place when it comes to gender discrimination. And we're at a different place when it comes to sexual orientation discrimination. And I may be simplistic, but that's how I understand the differences in the cases. Now, two other factors, though, that are um, also part of the history. Um, I think we've been living through a religious revival in this country. Um, and I think in many ways it's quite terrific. I think that uh, response to the kind of consumer culture and response to a culture that doesn't really care about the human dignity. I think it's great to see young people and uh, churches and synagogues and mosques kind of vibrant and uh, cultural uh, artifacts, uh, sitcoms that, that actually treat religion uh, responsibly. It's kind of an amazing thing. Um, and in relationship to that, we've had some very terrific lawyering. Uh, 
So when the Smith case was announced, I and many others participated in efforts to get RIFRA enacted. I remember going to an event at the Harvard Divinity School where we had members of every kind of religious group there and some people representing some uh, American Indian uh, traditions came and passed around a peace pipe, but I think it was the first time I smoked anything. I mean, I, it was a great experience. Um, th that's what I mean by religious revival. It's had a political dimension uh, and to the extent that there ever was some shyness on the part of some religious groups in participating poli uh, in politics, that's gone. That's really gone. And also coalitions, ecumenical coalitions, on the very issue of religion. So groups that never would have talked to each other, finding common ground. Um, and the great lawyering, you know, in fact, you know, Michael McConnell is really an enormous hero in this regard, coming up with a framework that said, okay, we're this old debate about separation of church and state and establishment clause, uh, let's think about viewpoint discrimination. Let's think about discrimination. Let's think about, in fact, the success of the anti-race discrimination movement in this country is that the dominant legal frame is equality. And in an era of identity politics, in fact, the best way to be recognized or left alone as a religious person is to claim a religious identity and to object to discrimination on the basis of religion as just another one of these identities. And that's the framework. And, and, and Michael, I really salute you because I think um, we would not have decisions about the approval of uh, vouchers permitting parents to pick religious schools without that kind of shift. Um, I think it's doctrinal, but it's really also connecting to these changes in the culture, changes that reflect identity politics and equality as a dominant framework, um, as well as a religious revival. Yes, there are lots of interesting doctrinal questions, separation of powers, federalism, but to my mind, these are the big shifts that matter historically. So now I'm gonna shift and talk about accommodation in a slightly different way. What worries me, and it may be related to Mark Tushnet's comments about institutional sensitivities, who's competent to do what. What worries me is if the issues that we are talking about are addressed by courts, there are only two answers, yes or no. And what's missing in my own view is accommodation in a different sense. The kind of accommodations that can occur when people of goodwill can sit across the table from each other and see what can we work out. And the example that I just still to this day find very, very powerful is uh, the example of um, Archbishop Lovada in San Francisco. Uh, so I don't know how many of you know the story, but at a time uh, when uh, the San Francisco enacted a, a law saying anybody who wanted to do business with the city of San Francisco had to provide health care benefits to same-sex couples, Immediately, the Orthodox Jewish groups and Catholic groups said, well, then that's the end of our doing business with the city of San Francisco. And that would have been the end of the discussion except for uh, an initiative undertaken by the Archbishop, Lovada, who reached out to the mayor, Mayor Willie Brown. And he said, and I quote, I'm in favor of increasing benefits, especially health care coverage, for anyone. As the Catholic bishops of the United States stated in 1993, every person has a right to adequate health care. I would welcome the opportunity to work with city officials to find ways to overcome what I believe is a national shame, the fact that so many Americans have no health coverage at all. I can be counted on to raise my voice in support of universal health coverage nationally and locally. I feel sure I could make common cause with city officials in working toward this truly urgent need. Willie Brown was a good politician. He recognized that this was a hand being offered, and he called up the archbishop. They met, they talked, and they negotiated a solution. And the solution addressed the concerns of both sides. As a result, the city deems a contracting party to be in compliance with the city's rules if, and I quote, it allows each employee to designate a legally domiciled member of the employee's household as being eligible for spousal equivalent benefits. And it can be a marital partner or romantic partner. It could be a sister, an aged aunt. It could be a homeless person who you brought in. 
the uh, interests of the uh, Catholic uh, bishops are advanced. Health care coverage is being extended. This is before, of course, the Affordable Care Act. Um, but also, uh, the interests of the church are respected. We can't get that from a court. That's just what courts can't do. The more that we litigate these cases, the less accommodation in the deepest sense we will have. Uh, I want to use my time also to focus on accommodations and in, in a in a more practical sense also, mm -hmm. I think, and looking at history from the non-historian's perspective, do forgive me. Um, and I, I want to bring up a, a few points as we think about the question. The course of the days, I think we'll be talking about both about the play in the theory, and then what I see really is the play in the states, or the play in the legislatures, and sort of what questions we might ask as, as we think about those, and what questions do we bring to bear about the rooms, the places where there are is room in the joints. Um, and I come from the ACLU, which we like to think of ourselves as respecting all the issues here, the religious questions as well as, as the questions of equality. When you hear people talk about accommodations in the next day and a half, one thing I just want to urge people to do is think about what kind of accommodation, really. We've been using the term pretty loosely, but I think there's a big difference between is it about an individual or is it about an institution? If it's an individual, is it a private individual? Is it a person acting in a, in a government capacity? If it's an institution, is it an institution that's really serving people of different faiths or hiring people of different faiths, otherwise opening itself up in the public sphere? Is it an institution that's getting public funding? And I think many of us may draw different lines in those different places because there are different implications as a result, both as a matter of law and as a matter of practicality. I want to use my time to talk about those institutions that are operating in what I'll just refer to loosely as the public marketplace. So here we are, you know, public accommodation, the age of civil rights, you know, incredible timing, just incredible timing right after Hobby Lobby. Here we are with the court debating what to do with Elaine Photography, the case of the photography studio that is arguing, at this point, arguing a free speech violation because of being required to comply with a public accommodation law in New Mexico that require it not to discriminate against people based on sexual orientation and therefore take photographs at a commitment ceremony. You know, it's no surprise that this debate is, is alive, robust, and sort of, as I say, a storm, um, because we are at one of these moments of major social transformation. You don't have to have this debate if we're not about to move towards some kind of mandate or change in law that's about non-discrimination, because otherwise, actually, you could, you could discriminate all you wanted before we had these, these questions. So the question is, once we have the new rule, who has to apply, and are we going to make accommodations? It's not a news story, and this is a variation on what Dean Minow was saying when you look at the civil rights era. I mean, if you look back the history sort of in the 1870s, early um, 1900s, is full of cases, case law, invoking a religious predicate that the races were meant to be separate as a way of justifying criminal penalties for violation of anti-misogenation laws to justify penalties for people who didn't stay in the colored car, and even fines you know, against Berea College for choosing to integrate early in the 20th century. There, as now, when, when you, we also saw, you know, we saw litigation and we saw efforts to change the, the legislation. We then have this moment of change. We have a moment of change, and I would focus earlier, where we then ultimately come to have debates about the Civil Rights Acts. In that context, there's a call for a broad accommodation. There's a call for an accommodation to the employment discrimination provisions that says religiously affiliated institutions would be able to discriminate, including based on race, right? That passes the house in that version. The ultimate measure that's passed provides for religiously affiliated institutions to be able to discriminate based on religion for what I think of as the co-religionists. You run a Catholic institution, you can choose to hire Catholics to carry out the function of your institution. But we did not ultimately pass the Civil Rights Act with the provision <coughs> saying that if your religious faith said that you wanted to preserve segregation, that you could therefore go ahead and do that under that act. In the face of that, we saw what we're seeing now, which was you, there's a case um, of a barbecue franchise out of South Carolina Piggy Park, which then resists compliance with the Civil Rights Act, 
on the ground that it was a violation of its religious faith, of its owner's faith. It was against God's will to actually serve African Americans at that restaurant, and the courts rejected that. In the anti-misogenation case, lower court, loving invokes religion as a way of upholding the law. Supreme Court reverses. And we get to Bob Jones. We get to Bob Jones um, in 1983, right? Bob Brown versus Board is 54. We get to Bob Jones, 1983. The IRS provision is passed in 71, as I recall, or uh, not passed, enacted um, in, in 1971 saying that you couldn't have a tax-exempt status if you were going to continue to engage in racial discrimination. So the story that we're seeing isn't new. And I guess one of the questions I would have as we have these debates, I mean, I'm involved in these debates all the time about what kind of a, what sort of accommodation, if any, is appropriate in the context of, for example, laws prohibiting discrimination in employment on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity and public accommodations mm -hmm. based on sexual orientation and gender identity. Why would, we, why would we do something different here? What's the theory? What's the sort of, what theory, what, how does a theory that we put forward cut in that way? Does our theory, what would a theory that we have about how the Constitution functions say about those debates in the racial context? And therefore, do we sort of live with that? What debate, what do we say in the legislative arena in that context? It's a question I just put out there. A second one from history, and I, I, I completely respect that um, the, the call on, on, I would say, both sides, loosely speaking, of the, of the political debate for permissive accommodations. Um, and some, I mean, I respect this and I understand where it comes from for sure. It comes from a notion of respect, of wanting to take account of the heartfelt sensibilities on both sides. And one of the other ways it comes out is a question about saying change will stick more. You, you will be able to avoid backlash. This is sensible and or practical, right? It's a, it's a, for some people, it's a, a strategic consideration. For other people, it's really a fundamental way to respect religious, religious liberty and the, the heartfelt natures of, of people asking for an accommodation. Um, and to that, I just want to raise a couple examples. One is Bob Jones. So Bob Jones. Bob Jones didn't get an out um, in terms of what government rules they provided. And in 2000, Bob Jones issued an apology. Bob Jones issued an apology for its policy of segregation and issued a policy, an apology for its, mm -hmm. its failure to accommodate interracial couples. And it, interestingly, it talks in its, in its apology about the having been caught up in the times in yeah. some sense. And it talks about now sort of having found its understanding scripture to, to support integration. I don't know the answer to the following question, but I put out the following question. Would Bob Jones have come to that had Bob Jones been accommodated? I look at, I, I, I've spent years in the reproductive rights world. Roe, 1973, ink barely dry on decision. Along comes the Church Act. The Church Act is a, is a statute passed by Congress that provides, loosely speaking, broad exemptions, i.e. accommodations, for any institution or individual is it, that receives government funds, that would be most every hospital, for example, to refuse to provide abortions or sterilization, or to discriminate against staff because they provide or refuse to provide abortion or accommodation based on religious or moral objections. I'd say that that didn't really quiet the storm. Um, it didn't really quiet the storm as to abortion in general, and it certainly hasn't quieted the storm as to the question of religious accommodations. One of the more recent cases we, sort of, we saw were nurses asking for arguing um, a religious freedom violation if they were required to provide post and pre-operative care. And that, that involved blood pressure, do you have a ride home, are you ready to go? That was not OR work. So by which I mean, the question about the scope of accommodations, this comes back to something you know, Mark has written about, the other sort of where do you draw the lines and who gets excluded and not excluded. Now I know, right, abortion has a special place in America. And so we might say, bad example, Melling. Um, but we look at even what's happening with contraception. In the contraception rule, originally there was an exemption for, we'll call it loosely, for houses of worship. Storm. Obama administration attempts to accommodate 
and creates a, a rule for religiously affiliated institutions that says you have to, if you're a religiously affiliated institution, nonprofit, you certify that you object and then your insurer will have to pick it up. But you will not be the person, you will not be required to administer, pay for, her, but you have to sign the certification. And again, now this story's in play, and stories that are in play versus old are very, very different. I understand the limitations of everything I'm saying. And there are limitations. But I still say that those stories at least should give us pause about whether, A, accommodations, whether how many opportunities there are in our current climate for some of these compromises, and then what the compromises ultimately yield in some sense. Do they, in fact, have that kind of power? Which is Bob Jones versus abortion and contraception. My next point is I think there has been, and I'm sure people in the audience will differ with me, Tremendous, and by which I mean very real and very powerful articulation of what it means to be a person of faith, an owner of business of faith, and be asked, required, to do something that runs deeply contrary to your views. And as we think about the accommodation question, that's real. But one thing I just want to throw out is also just, again, this goes back to the third parties, is about the harm of being turned away. I think in these, at least in the legislative context, and as we think about compromises, it doesn't mean people aren't going to still go for them, right? It's just a question of what the cost is and to articulate that cost of what I refer to as being turned away. I'm just going to go back to the Civil Rights Act in the Senate Judiciary Committee in you know, 1964 debates. Um, conversations, the primary purpose is to solve this problem, the deprivation of personal dignity that surely accompanies denials of equal access to public establishments. Discrimination is not simply dollars and cents, hamburgers and movies. It is the humiliation, frustration, and embarrassment that a person must surely feel when he is told that he is unacceptable as a member of the public. Or as Van Jones recently said around the debate of, of Arizona and the question of a modification to a RIFRA. We work for centuries, we work for centuries, yes, and decades too, to get rid of those words, we don't serve your kind here. That the issue is not, can I get a cake? I can probably get a cake somewhere else, right? The issue is, what does it feel like when somebody closed the door on me and says, you can't get a cake here, I won't serve you here? That issue is both real at that immediate moment, and that issue is also real about the broader issue that we're trying to deal with when we think about why we're trying to advance anti-discrimination laws. We're trying to advance anti-discrimination laws in very significant parts so we can say to people who've been shut out, we, now, we are now going to create a rule to embrace you and open this up. What happens then if that's the rule, and I go to a store, and I get turned away by sanction of the government, by sanction of a law. That sends a message, I think, about you know, sort of whether or not I actually think that, that that promise that's been offered to me by these laws is, in fact, real in some serious way. We had somebody recently sort of explain this to us in a certain sense. She and her girlfriend had been traveling and going to inns, and she was like, you know, if you're traveling in the car, and every time you have to go into the inn, and you're anxious about whether somebody's literally going to turn you away from the inn, um, what does that mean? And if you get turned away once, how do you then approach the next? What is the promise we're offering and what does civil rights mean? What does civil rights mean and do we want to have those tears? I, I understand in some sense those tears are in some sense a reflection of where society is, but the law drives as well as, as holds back in some sense, which takes me just to my last point, which is really about the function of law and how, what roles it has played. Um, when we think about the, the law vis-a-vis -vis race, I think the law, the debate is real. The Civil Rights Act and the fact that we don't have public accommodations for people motivated by religious beliefs to continue segregation, sent that, the fact that the law is structured that way sent a very, very real message, a cultural message, that discrimination was not OK. It's not magic, right? It hasn't been the perfect solution. We still live in a sort of, you know, sort of woefully segregated society in many profound respects. But we know that it's not okay. In contrast, I really look at what's happened vis-a-vis -vis either, you know, in the gender arena. 
I look at what's happened vis-a-vis -vis abortion, where we have a standard where in 1973 we said it's okay for institutions, including hospitals, to shut their doors and turn people away. I look at what it means to think that a nurse wouldn't have to touch you, right? And, you know, as I say, remember, abortion is about women. There's a woman there, right? So it is about turning her away in a sense, and you add to it this notion that pregnancy discrimination is not sex discrimination. And I think it has, it, that, that message from the law, right? I can't, I'm not here, I can't prove this, right? But I certainly can intuit it and offer it as a question. Those messages as a matter of culture, I think have contributed in significant part to some of the challenges we face today of at least having the conversation about the contraception rule being about religious liberty and civil rights as opposed to about a pill and religious liberty, if that makes sense. We, we just haven't had a legal standard that has helped both protect women in advancing, and uh, protect women, not in my usual phrase, um, <laughs> as well as set a different norm. So as we go forward in, those, in, in these conversations, those are the four sort of charges or questions or backdrops I, I hope you'll all consider as we think about where we should be going in the future. Wow, well, that was a terrific set of opening uh, comments to get us started. Um, I think consistent with what I said earlier, I'd like to ask you know, the panelists first off to see if beyond having you know, uh, led, led with your, you know, your most important thoughts, if there are particular themes or you know, comments from your fellow panelists that individually I'd like, to, like to react to? Martha? I'd like to hear Mark's theological. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. yeah. Yeah. Mark, did you yeah. think anyone would ask? Me? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So uh, I, I do want to actually respond to something that uh, Martha said, uh, which is connected to my quasi-theological position. Uh, and it's actually connected to something that Louise said as well. Um, uh, one problem with a, world the, with a world in which there is both the possibility of what I will call bureaucratic accommodations <laughs> and negotiations, uh, and the backdrop of a law of possible mandatory accommodations is that it doesn't fully take into account how incredibly diverse, pluralistically diverse the country is. So no matter what bureaucratic accommodation you work out, there will be somebody who has a sincere religious uh, uh, objection to it. You know, I, I think that I don't want to make a big deal about this, but I think the sort of stand in for that point is the Little Sisters of Mercy. These are people who, is that the name of it? Or? Of the poor. Of the poor, poor. okay. So, uh, so um, yeah, they think that it is a violation of their, their religious liberty to sign this piece of paper, but apparently not to file a document in court <laughs> saying that they have this objection. Uh, uh, or at least that's what the Supreme Court says. Uh, so, you know, somebody, somebody will now say, well, I have an objection to filing this paper in court. Uh, uh, so the, um, so the theological, and, and one of the things, this is, I, the theological position is what I call pro-religion strict separation. Uh, and, and the idea is that, the, I, I, one line that I, I have to, get out. This is from the uh, uh, Mennonite theologian, John Howard Yoder. Um, and it's, I heard it in this context of accommodations. It's not the Christian's business to tell Satan what to do. Uh, that's what seeking accommodations is. It is Christians telling Satan what they're supposed to do, what Satan's supposed to do. And it's not their business. I think that's a very powerful theological point. Uh, and it's not irrelevant that it comes from a Mennonite and a Baptist old-fashioned Baptist tradition, because they were pro-religion strict separationists. And in, the context, in, in this context, the, there's a risk, two risks I'd want to identify. One is the backlash, not against the legislation, but against religion. Uh, and, and I think we're observing that in the Hobby Lobby context. Uh, the, the, pro-civil rights people articulate their positions in ways that are anti-religious. Mm -hmm. 
And there is a delicate line between uh, corruption of religious views because of the availability of accommodations and reconsidering your theological commitments in light of new knowledge. Uh, Bob Jones says it was doing the latter. In uh, my, my version of this is that the internal Mormon story about the revelations is of that sort. And I think it's fair to say that virtually no non-Mormon believes that account. That is, they, they believe that the Mormons succumb to, to governmental pressure. That's not what the Mormons say. I want to make that clear. Uh, but distinguishing between what everybody who's not a Mormon thinks the Mormons did and what the Mormons think they did is very tricky and troublesome. So that's mine. Other comments, responses, Michael? Um, yeah. I, had, I had a few small um, comments. Uh, I, I agreed with a large part of what um, Martha says, but I think it may not, it, I think the, the doctrinal world is actually more complicated than the characterization to say that race, gender, and sexual orientation are treated differently. I, I think that when you drill down that there are other things going on that just makes that much more complicated. Um, so, uh, for example, uh, race, I think, if the government ever told uh, a church that it could not, uh, let's say the black Muslims, that they had to have a white minister, uh, they would win, the church would win. Uh, I, I mean, it, and so the question of, of choosing your clergy is a trump, whether it's race, gender, or sexual orientation. Um, the example of gender that Martha, you gave was a private school being able to discharge a pregnant teacher. If, I rem if we're thinking about the same case, this was an unmarried teacher uh, and a church that doesn't believe in, uh, in sex before marriage and somebody teaching the children, and when they know that she's not married and here she is pregnant, it's, uh, it's a fairly, it's, it's not really gender discrimination per se, uh, it is. It has something to do with the schools being able to to communicate its message, having to do with uh, sex before marriage. So, and 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 I think about another case, which is the uh, Grove City College case, which is straightforward gender. It's much more parallel to the Bob Jones uh, decision, and it comes out the same way. Uh, so, gender and race are treated the same when it comes to actual. Can you discriminate against somebody on the basis of their of who they are? But it becomes more nuanced when it's um, it's a behavior which is associated. And I think that the sexual orientation is likely, at least in the short run, to play out much the same way. That is to say, uh, if a, a a business were to refuse service to someone because of their uh, being gay, or even because of being gay and married, my guess is that they will lose. Uh, but if the business is refusing to provide services in connection with the ceremony of marriage, or in the Elaine photography case, uh, a commitment uh, a ceremony, they'll probably win because there's a difference between discriminating on the basis of people and requiring people to engage in and, uh, uh, and support and be part of the personnel uh, engaged in something that they think is, is wrong. And so I just, uh, I think that it's, and, and another thing that goes on in the cases is that there's a, 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 a drumbeat of difference between whether the, what is being uh, done is a, a denial of a subsidy on the one hand, or some sort of direct penalty on the other. And, and I just making, I think, the three categories are, are a little too uh, crisp. Um, then I can't resist responding to Mark a little bit on the, on the theological point, because you know, I do not think that the little sisters of the poor are telling Satan what to do. 
what they're saying is Satan shouldn't be able to tell them what to do, or at least in a free republic, uh, that they have a right to decide what to do, whether Satan wants them to or not. And uh, that seems to me to be something, maybe we, we think that the Little Sisters of the Poor shouldn't have the religious view that they do, that signing a piece of paper that authorizes uh, the provision of the contraceptive is maybe we think that they shouldn't do that. I mean, it's, I would sign such a piece of paper. It's not my religion, but you know, in a free republic, people can t take different views on things like that, or so it would seem to me. <clears throat> I can just respond about the, uh, the Christian cases and then just say something about the services. So one is, I just want my, oh, got it, sorry. Um, I don't think the law is so clear on the Christian school cases. And in fact, the question is being litigated right now. It has been litigated in more than one case. There's a, there's a, a number of cases happening right now. And it is, in fact, the case that in most of the situations, it's been a religiously affiliated school firing a woman, either because she's pregnant and unmarried or because she used in vitro or some other assisted form of technology. One of the issues about firing a woman because she's pregnant, because you have a rule against unmarried sex, is usually kind of shakes out, right, as to that the women get fired, um, because there isn't so much of an investigation as to whether or not the men have had premarital sex. And so it, it, under the language of the statute, which provides um, that you can discriminate based on religion, I think at least in, in Title VII, it's not based on religious tenets. And so that question is not closed. Just on the question of, of services, I mean, you know, I do go back just to ask the question in, in the sense we can we look at loving, we look at the other cases, we can we know about interfaith marriages and, and the diversity of views about that. This isn't just about everybody gets to have their own view. This is about people who have chosen to enter a commercial marketplace and are offering their services. And I just I I don't think well, we didn't take that same stance vis-a-vis -vis interracial couples in the public accommodations statutes. And so I just present the question again. When it comes to services, I don't in any way doubt the, the sincerity or the challenge for people in, in terms of engaging in business that's contrary to views. Um, but are we applying a un are we applying a similar rule? Are we sort of changing our rules based on who's on the other side of the lens? And if so, why, both as a matter of sort of theory and as a matter of practice. And there's, there's definitely a cost. I'm not saying there isn't a cost to the person. I'm not, I don't, whether or not it's a legally cognizable cost is a different question. I don't doubt that there's a cost to the person who's taking the photos. But again, I just want to say I think there's a very real cost, and one that's not as robustly articulated in all the debates to the person who was, who was shunned in some sense. I think that this borders on the question of the public-private distinction, which I've always found very confusing. Because I think that we often use the distinction as if there were just two realms. And there are at least three. So there's really, really private you know, family and maybe clubs that are really small. Uh, and then there's really, really public, which is the government. And then there's this thing in the middle. And this thing in the middle Sometimes it's public and sometimes it's private. And, and, and I do think that uh, the Hobby Lobby and some of the other current cases are really going to force us to uh, acknowledge that the commercial space, the places in which people have contractual relationships, which, by the way, is, is a big issue in a lot of these Christian schools where the teachers have signed contracts and then it's about contract interpretation. I, th I think that that's, that's increasingly the legal question, which is how do we view this sphere that is uh, about commercial relationships? And are commercial relationships to be governed by something that says, in a kind of uh, Rawlsian way, we don't look at who's there. That we can't have free commerce. We can't have markets. If you look at who's on the other side, it has to be anybody. Or do we say, no, actually, even in this sphere, the, the commitments that you have in the private, the most private setting, are the ones that we will honor? If so, we're going to have a very different set of markets. Um, well, we have about half an hour left, but you know, I'm sure there are lots of questions and comments out there. So I'd like to open it up, and we'll just fire away. Maybe identify them. And identify yourself when you. All right. Uh, Andy Coughlin in Northwestern Law School. Uh, my question's for Louise. 
Uh, just one aspect of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 is that it seems likely that if there had been a religious exemption from the public accommodations provision in the Civil Rights Act of 1964, that probably the entire universe of discriminators would have immediately pounced on that exemption, would have exercised that exemption, and would have nullified the operation of the statute. And I just want your judgment on this. If uh, lane photography got its way, or if legislatively there was an accommodation for religious objectors, do you think that the same nullification of protection against discrimination for sexual orientation would occur? I, the, the, the base, you're right, the base narrative is different, right? The base narrative where you had a system, you know, Berea College gets fined because it chose of its own free volition to admit African-American students, right? It was operating in a world where the law said you had to be separate. And so there was a more intense blanketing. I don't think every single person would have, would have availed themselves of it. I think, obviously, right, there were businesses previously that were trying to do differently. But I think the backdrop is different. No, we don't have every single business availing themselves of it. But I think if you go back, uh, so that's real, right? That is, a, that is a genuine difference. But I think if you go back, you know, just thinking either about the Judiciary Committee's statement about what it means to be turned away, or just thinking about people's experience, I think that, that notion about the dignitary harm and the, the sort of the challenge to your notion of equality and what it means to be welcomed into society is 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 still very real, even in the very in the different factual context. Tom McFarland, Mr. Church. I just was wondering, um, the lane photography case. Um, if, if let's assume a lane photography loses on that, and, and that seems to be very analogous to the case that this institution, like this law school, went through the court of appeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And there was a prohibition, and the court in that case, something versus Rumsfeld, I'm sorry, I forgot. Fair. Fair. Said, <laughs> we lost nine to zero. What yeah. else do you want to say? <laughs> but who's counting? Yeah. But the court seemed to imply there that, that, that uh, Harvard and the rest of the schools that were opposing could almost have counter protests. It's almost like you could protest outside the interview room. And I'm just wondering if, if the Elaine photography case, where does their speech rights come? Assuming they lose, I mean, can they wear a T-shirt to the wedding that says, you know, marriage from the man and the woman? Uh, that would seem to not be something anyone would really want. Could they protest on their website? We'll provide this if because we're forced to, but we really oppose this. Where, you know, assuming they lose, where does that intersection become their ability to, to advocate and yet still, you know, comply with the statute? I don't have a full answer to that, but I do have two reflections. One is, one difference between a speech approach and a free exercise approach is that one can exercise one's free speech even while being compelled to comply with the law. And I don't know how you preserve your religious conscience when you're forced to comply with the law. That's a difference, it seems to me. Your question, though, raises something that's also in litigation, which is what is harassment? At what point does yes. the uh, expression by one that's viewed by that person as free speech end up being harassment or, or producing a hostile environment for another? And that's under litigation. I think that's a hard question. Um, one is with regard to the social movement's narrative, um, and that is, I think, oftentimes, uh, here's your comment on how these discussions sometimes get influenced, if not distorted, because we're very focused on race, gender, sexual orientation. Um, yet, um, when Washington and Oregon incorporate into their position assisted suicide laws, an absolute right for pharmacists and other healthcare professionals not to dispense uh, assisted suicide prescriptions that doesn't raise the human cry. Um, or, and you can give many other examples like that as well. Um, and uh, relatedly, uh, the, the notion that, um, that, that how it feeds into the, the desire for the pragmatic, you know, can't let, let us call common reason together, 
kind of thing which would be so nice in Washington University, uh, and it's more and more scarce, is that uh, unfortunately folks in the vanguard of the social movement who are very passionate about it um, uh, are also not, and, and, and think that ultimately history is on their side, and ultimately things are going to come out a certain way, become less and less interested in making what they view as concessions, um, even if they are practical, and even if they'll help them advance certain things, so that even though here in the state of Massachusetts, the law on the state level, on the books, allows pharmacists um, to not dispense contraceptive uh, type prescriptions if there is another pharmacist in place to make sure that the woman with the valid prescriptions will get it. It's the women's uh, reproductive rights groups in Washington that have blocked that legislation from being with that kind of you know, trade-off, with that kind of balancing test being, applied, being implemented federally at the national level. So two thoughtful comments. Um, just starting where you end up, this idea of a kind of accommodation that allows for um, an individual provider of a service to say, I will not do so, conditioned on the availability of another, um, is um, precisely what is not available right now in abortion, right? So, I mean, it seems to me if that were actually on the table in more instances, I'm for it. I think that the availability of a uh, a nurse to be able to say, no, I will not participate in this activity if there's another nurse. But if there's no other nurse, then it's got to be me. That, that seems to me like a plausible position. Now, that's not about law. That's about policy. It's unfortunately part of your second comment. We, we don't seem to have room for those kinds of discussions right now. And I think that one of the tragedies as a story in the domain that this conference is attending to is what happened when Catholic Charities withdrew from adoption services in Massachusetts. And the rigidity was on both sides. The rigidity, the, you had the Catholic Charities saying, we currently refer those cases to those other people that do those cases. But the Commonwealth said, well, that doesn't comply with our law. And so Catholic Charities said, then we withdraw. I don't think anybody's better off from that. I think that was a terrible, terrible result. And so what did Catholic Charities do in withdrawing? It took all of its cases and referred it to the other organizations that would handle them. Well, why couldn't they continue? So, so if that were available more often, I, I, you know, on the other hand, I'm affected by Louise's comments. If you imagine now playing that out in a racial context, I won't engage in a contractual relationship with you if there's one other person in town who will engage in a contractual relationship with you. When you think about the legislative history of Section 1981, where there actually were evidence that there were uh, builders of coffins who would not build a coffin for a black person. I, 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 I mean, they're dignitary harms. And so yes, there's one person in the town who will build a coffin for you. That, that's, I think, uh, there's something wrong with that too. I just want to respond a, a little bit too, because I think there's a difference between the individual and the institution again. I think when you were talking about Massachusetts, I mean, we, for example, have written about the pharmacy question, have said if there's a pharmacy, you're, if there's another pharmacist available, then you should accommodate. And Title VII calls for those kinds of accommodations of employees. That's true of the doctor in the hospital, if there's the other doctor available. And, <coughs> and part of the predicate of that is that you can accommodate and somebody can still get services. My understanding of Washington was that was about a pharmacy, whether a pharmacy, the entire institution, as distinct from an individual, would have the right of refusal. And what's different, at least in, in the states vis-a-vis, -vis, uh, vis -vis, at least in some of the countries, I'm not going to pretend to, to actually know a lot, but in some places, the refusals in, in other places are, in fact, even conditioned on you being, in, you being sure that there's somebody else who would provide the service and that somebody will get the care as opposed to that you get sent off into the never-never land. Now, I think there's still questions about that in terms of what it means to say to somebody who comes in for birth control, we won't provide this, this service that is you know, widely used, critical, says the Supreme Court to women's equality. I understand this is a private institution. And, but you can go 10 miles away and get it or something because, we, again, we wouldn't say that 
it's, I think in part because we see it as a service and not as a person. It's not viewed as a status issue, even though to some of us it is a status issue. It's not about turning, a, it's not about turn, I think people think it's about a medicine as opposed to that you're turning away a woman for something that's actually quite core to gender. Um, so individual accommodations, I think, happen all the mm -hmm. time. I, I think those are commonly accepted uh, yeah. and, and proposed and worked through, but I do think institutions are different. Sir. Sure. My name is Paul Southwood, and I represent transgender students and faculty members who have been discriminated against by religious colleges and universities. Mm -hmm. And one thing that you often hear in the abortion or uh, uh, gay and lesbian context of discrimination is that there are <coughs> clearly defined theologies and rules related to same-sex conduct and behavior or abortion, and that is justifying the discrimination. In the context of gender identity and transgender mm -hmm. discrimination, there's often not a theology. Um, but what I continually hear from the institutions is that we're, we're theologically opposed, but there's no policy, there's no theology. So to what extent do you think that a deeply held religious view has to sort of be verified or has to be grounded in a theology or written in a policy before it could be relied on as a basis um, for an accommodation? Well, <laughs> And as a doctrinal matter, I think the, the test is whether this is sincere. sincere, sincere, sincere. sincere. Yeah. Uh, and sincere. Without an inquiry into the background. Uh, uh, and, and the courts are, I think, for understandable institutional reasons, have been quite reluctant to question the claim of sincerity, of sincere belief. Uh, I, I think that issues like the one that uh, Andy Koppelman raised about inventing a belief so as to insulate from uh, uh, something as to which you have a non-religious objection um, might become serious. Uh, and and uh, I think as a technical doctrinal matter, it's open to say um, your asserted religious claim is not sincerely held. You can't give us anything prior to this litigation or prior to this incident that indicates that you have any thought, devoted any thought to this issue before. I don't think courts would be very comfortable doing that, with, uh, engaging in those inquiries, but I think it's doctrinally open. The courts curiously do it sometimes in the prison context. I mean, that's the one, I mean, I'm sorry, that's yeah. the one con context where you see, I'm not defending it. I'm just <laughs> stating a fact. Yeah, and, and, and well, it, actually, I mean, I, I, to, to clarify that, I think the reason why prisons, that happens is because there are often claims for things that anybody would want. Um, and, and I think across the board, uh, when religious claims are for... Um, or, or for a benefit that anyone would wish to have, that they're always greeted with a, a degree more skepticism. I want to say just to, to the uh, to the question. Um, uh, I mean, personally and, and and religiously, I agree with you. I do not think that conservative Protestant Christianity has any basis for uh, any teaching against transgendered. People, and I think it's simply a misunderstanding. Um, I have been in conservative Protestant circles where uh, transgendered people are entirely welcome to the service. I think that I think that this is something where some respectful conversation actually will do a lot of good because this is something new for people. It's, hmm. uh, but I, I I think that this is quite different from the same-sex marriage issue uh, where, uh, where the biblical uh, problems are going to be much more insurmountable. Uh, but uh, doctrinally, you know, legally speaking, uh, you don't have to justify, you don't have to be able to show that your theology is, is, um, is accurate in order to, uh, to have the claim. Just one more thing, I think the point, Andy Koppelman's excellent Point, I think was not so much about insincerity and fakery. 
I think his point is that the government has a much different interest uh, when it is breaking down a whole societal uh, uh, thing. That is, uh, the problem with racial discrimination in the South was that uh, everyone did it, right? And I think that the, that, the, that the state has a much more compelling interest in dealing with even private discrimination under those circumstances than it does when they're just sort of isolated people who are, you know, who are holdouts or dissenters from the, uh, from the social norm for much the same reason that in the area of uh, hostile environment law, stray comments are one thing, but a whole uh, workplace that is suffused uh, is a very different uh, a matter. I think we can all understand that there are idiosyncratic people out there that might you know, object to us, that might be very insulting to us. It's quite different to have that than to have a whole, uh, to have the whole society uh, uh, taking a, a view. Um, I'm Sarah Lunchheim at the ACLU of Massachusetts. I wanted to go back to Catholic Charities for a minute. Mm -hmm. Not uh, used to do uh, gay parent adoptions, and then was told by the Pope at the time it's to true. no longer do them. And the issue, I think, which gets to something that hasn't been talked about very much here, is that they were doing them with government, government. contracts mm -hmm. and a lot of taxpayer dollars. And they said, we're not going to do them. And they lost the contracts. And Mitt Romney, when he was governor, tried to get the legislature to change, make an exception, yeah. which the legislature did not do. And I think I don't want my tax dollars being used for discrimination. Other agencies took over. There's been no problem. But I think the issue of millions of dollars of taxpayer money being used to support religious mm -hmm. institutions that want to use their doctrine in the public sphere, they want our money to do it, there's something, I mean, religious freedom isn't necessarily easy, right? Yeah. You may have, you may not get the funding from the government that you want, but I think that's an important distinction. So it's, you're absolutely right, it's absolutely critical. Here's my problem, we have a continuum, because we could also say they should lose their tax exemption. Mm -hmm. We could also say that we should criminalize it. So I just don't know where we stop on that. So you're right about that distinction. I just, I, I'm not sure um, that, we, that your logic of your reasoning stops with the contract. Um, so I just going back on like the whole adoption um, period that, um, that we were talking about earlier and how money is being spent and how religions can um, discriminate choose or try to choose, um, you know, how they, they, they give care. Um, and just off the top of my head, little research, I was like a, almost $200 million were paid to get pineal pumps for men. So I'm wondering what kind of like on accommodations were done on, you know, religious basis for, those, for that kind of money. Like, you know, are they part of the, the sexual cycle as well where they question? I'm just trying to figure out where does the Medicaid money and all that stuff factor into these religious things when it comes to men, but then we're having all this discussion when it comes to women, when all the money is being done to affect, you know, to achieve the same effect. So, I don't know if I'm being clear. That one's yours. <laughs> <laughs> Could you restate the question? I, at least I didn't hear parts of it. <laughs> As I understand the question, it is, is lots of government dollars going to support penile implants through Medicare and other government insurance programs? And we don't hear why is that being treated differently in discourse, say, than contraception? And so why is a service for men being treated different than a service for women? I think it's because there hasn't, I'm not aware of anybody objecting on religious grounds to either having to provide that, to providing that. In, first of all, I don't think there's, a mandate. Well, I don't know. But I don't know the Medicaid rules. Um, but let's pretend there's a mandate under Medicaid. Um, I'm not sure I know. I've never heard of a religious entity objecting on, on religious grounds. But it looks like Mary, do you want to no, respond? I just wanted to, to respond. There was actually a question I was going to ask. Um, the schools that will fire the pregnant unmarried teacher, uh, do they provide Viagra to unmarried men? Uh, because I understand that they should have no religious. So I guess, and, and what I wanted to get out of that was a point of information for you, and you just answered it by saying you don't know of any objections. 
that I was going to uh, transform into a question of, of doctrine and policy for the panel, which is what level of consistency is demanded of a religious objector, which is a different question from the Thomas question. Their views can be idiosyncratic, but given that they have a view, to what extent are they forced to apply the view consistently over the fields in which they operate? That was my question. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think the doctrinal answer to that is if the, so the question is, is sincerity, and one of the ways in order to prove insincerity uh, is inconsistency. On the other hand, um, if it is a claim that the religion itself is treating things inconsistently and it shouldn't, uh, you can't go into that. But if an individual, if, if for example, you're claiming that you, don't, you can't work on the Sabbath, uh, but it turns out that you're, you know, mowing the lawn and and babysitting, uh, doing doing various things uh, uh, on the Sabbath. You're going to lose your case. But I think your question is a little bit different. I think. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Mark. If you want. No, I I I I don't actually don't think that the Sabbatarian who mows all that that person has to say is that my religious belief is that. I can't work in the paid economy yes, yes, on the Sabbath. Um, I mean, and uh, and I, I also I'll go back to my you know wild religious pluralism in this world. I, I it's hard for me to imagine. Uh, partly, well, so I, well, it's hard for me to imagine how one could establish that a set of religious beliefs was internally inconsistent because I don't know what the standard for assessing consistency would be other than internal to the religion no. itself. But here, I, I agree that in, the proof of internal inconsistency in the religious belief is not, uh, that's not going to happen. But f when somebody states their religious belief and then only, and, and, and then violate it when it's convenient, that is something that the courts will pay attention to. In, in Marianne's case, this is a Title VII question. Right? I'm just going to be small. I'm just going to do practical lawyer things. It's a Title VII <clears throat> question, and the question raised by the women who are fired for being pregnant and unmarried <coughs> is sex discrimination. The response then is, it's not sex discrimination. We have a rule against unmarried sex. And then the question becomes, right. well, has any man in the history of, you know, how does that get applied? How do you actually make sure that that's applied? How do you know except by virtue of an observable pregnancy? In which case, then the only people subject to your rule happen to be women and happen to be because of pregnancy and therefore we can make a sex discrimination claim. Well, I was going to go beyond that to say if you do have a rule against unmarried sex, should you not therefore be obligated to fail to fund Viagra for your unmarried male employees? Who pays for Viagra? Insurance companies. It's. I mean, this. This is. Is that is that a mandate too? <laughs> but this is this is why the contraception. <laughs> if you went to your doctor, yeah. I think Kai wants oh, out on uh, Title Seven. Uh, uh, nice. uh, what next? I say. Uh, on, on this point, actually, so. What if the employer, I literally don't know this, but I, you know, a, a, well, a legally and well-advised and sophisticated employer might say, well, we have this religiously-based objection to um, non-marital sex, uh, and we also have a religious, uh, religiously-based tenet of avoiding as much as we can intrusive inquiries into the personal lives of our congregants. Put those together, we're not going to ask the guys if the women show up pregnant. We don't have to make, we don't have, we can, we can act on the combination of our religious beliefs. So I have a small forest of hands now, and we have about <laughs> 10 minutes left, so, um, so try, to be, try to be as succinct as possible. Just work around from this way, and we'll you know, go Hi, ahead. I'm yeah. Layla Labadley from the Metro Women's Law Center, and it plays onto this question of going on about what is a sincere belief. And what Virtual burden. Hobby Lobby was covering the contraceptives objection <coughs> now before the litigation. The Eden Foods owner went on and on about how he didn't care about government regulation. 
And so how, what do you do when it seems there is these strong political currents of just government regulation going on with concurrently with these religious objections? And if that in the previous ones, you know, I'm in this game right now, but what happened previously in these debates in Bob Jones? Were there these undercurrents of the religious belief kind of going along, but right now we have a very strong anti-ACA current? And so did that, was that going on, or was because it was so widespread, discrimination was so widespread that it was, it was not cool to be against racial discrimination, whereas it's not so clear if it's cool to be against not covering our covering. You know, Martha, since, since you made the strongest case for politics earlier, do you want to? You well, want to uh, just a small thought. I mean, I'm not an expert on this, but my understanding is that when approached by the Beckett Foundation, uh, the owners uh, said, well, we didn't know that our insurance was covering this, these contraceptives, and we don't like it. Now, is there not just a duty of consistency, but a duty of investigation or a duty of like knowing what you're doing? Uh, and if you don't, uh, you know, be, but you know, seriously, I mean, and, and I don't know how, I, I don't think it's going to make any difference here. I don't think there is such a duty. But is it a dangerous, do you enter in, in structuring an accommodation if it does develop, does that start to stretch lines in ways that people have been discussing that maybe it shouldn't, the opportunity shouldn't be there? Hmm? Yeah. Go ahead. sure that I understand what you're getting at. What Matt, uh, Madison is, you know, writing in a, in a context way before the uh, welfare regulatory state kicks in, and when and he's using, you know, legal concepts of the day. Private rights would mean uh, basically your common law endowment of rights, and public peace you know, there, uh, there are, I think, 14 sections of Blackstone that tell you what public peace means, and it, it essentially is the is there the laws having to do with not stealing and and violent uh, the, the basic you know public order functions of the uh, of the government. My point was just that the modern Ruth Ginsburg didn't cite Madison, but that when she's talking about uh, the need to take into account private rights. Uh, uh, that uh, she had a, that there was a historical pedigree for that, that it isn't just something that the modern Supreme Court has made up, and to me that gives uh, that opinion a, you know, a, a greater degree of legitimacy. That was all that I was saying. Please, sir, can you just answer the last part of the question? Um, I mean, I think that, uh, I think that when people show that they have a sincere religious uh, reason to be uh, to, to object to an imposition that the government is imposing upon them, that a that it is good for a free republic uh, to cut them slack as, when they can. Uh, now that you can't cut them slack when it uh, when it impinges upon an important uh, governmental purpose, and that's something that is going to differ from time to time, and you know, depend upon uh, you know current day uh, uh, political circumstances and so forth. But uh, uh, but uh, I think the underlying principle is uh, is sound. Sir, um, Jay Michelson with uh, Political Research Associates. The Hobby Lobby Court last week spent a lot of time asking about corporate personhood in particular. 
uh, and seemed actually pretty clear that person under under RIFRA did actually include corporations, which a, a number of uh, sort of advocates in the uh, the audience were disappointed to to see. I'm curious how the question of whether of corporate personhood how that impacts the theories, particularly that have been been enunciated on accommodation and on sincerity. Does it matter that it, that it's a corporate person uh, being accommodated as opposed to a, a person? Well, we'll find out. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, my guess, and this is just totally a, a guess, is that the court will say something like, uh, we're not going to consider all corporations, that, but that these particular corporations are uh, closely held, uh, personally managed by the owners, and at least they have uh, free exercise rights. And then my further guess is that the issue will never come up with regard to a faceless, uh, publicly held corporation, because none of them have, none of them would ever uh, be interested in invoking uh, free exercise rights, with the possible exception of maybe a corporation that provides a religious service, like a a, a, a kosher food company. Or, or my father uh, used to be a, used to work in the edible oils business. And they had a one of their lines of products were kosher uh, shortenings, and they complied with Jewish law, even though not a single person, you know, in the in the factory was Jewish. They had rabbis come in and tell them what to do, and they did it. I think that in, that a corporation like that could invoke free exercise rights, really not on its own behalf so much as on the behalf of its uh, a customer base, because it's. You know, it's, this is the way we have free exercise in this country, is that when they're religious products, they need to be uh, made in the way that's uh, going to be appropriate. So, you know, whether things are corporations or not seem to me not as kind of a side issue. It's The question is, are there people who are engaging in the free exercise of religion through something that happens to have a corporate form? So uh, I, I actually don't have strong views about the coverage of RIFRA, that whether corporations are persons under RIFRA. Uh, but it, it does seem, it, it, so I think about it in free exercise terms. Do they have, do corporations have rights to religious conscience? And, and uh, this is actually in some ways tied to Andy Tomlin's point. Uh, nobody doubts that if somebody, if Hobby Lobby were organized as a two-person partnership, the partner, could, ex could claim free exercise rights. Again, I'm not saying anything about the river. Uh, or the kosher butcher, the butcher, organized as a sole proprietorship. He can claim uh, free exercise rights. So then the question is, well, how come they decided not to organize themselves as a two-person partnership? Or, uh, and the answer is they saw some financial advantage in organizing themselves as a corporation. And at that point, I started worrying about Andy's point about, you know, having, have, I, I put it in a little piece I published, a, uh, they, they have a competitive advantage now over other hobby service suppliers because they don't have to pay a cost that their competitors have to pay. If they want to exercise their free exercise rights, I'm saying this much more forcefully than I really believe, but uh, <laughs> if they want to exercise their free exercise rights, get rid of the limited liability and all the advantages they get out of the corporate form, then I have no problem with it. But get it, uh, organize as a corporation and get a competitive advantage over the store down the block, that sort of bothers me. Final question over here. Um, hi, Feldman EOC. So first, I just want to thank you for this panel. It's just really been amazing. I think it's certainly rare in my experience to actually hear something on a panel that makes me potentially rethink some thoughts. And I have to say that, Louise, you made probably one of the strongest arguments I have heard. I think I'm more aligned with Martha in terms of some of my issues in terms of accommodation, but I just you know, who knows? Um, I'm not saying them. I'm changing my now by tomorrow at whatever time I speak. <laughs> but I have a question for Michael McConnell that is picking up a Marianne Peace's question. 
and maybe doesn't get lost in some of the places where it got lost. Obviously, under Title VII, a religious organization can hire people of their own religion. Under Amos, the court said, even it was deciding that there was no establishment clause problem with that, but they were, they clearly, even though it doesn't say religious tenants, they took away jobs from folks that did not have the certification from the Mormon church. So my question is for you, your understanding of Title VII law right now, if a religious organization says, I'm not going to hire someone who I don't think is a good Jew or good Christian um, because they are engaging in same-sex activity, <coughs> is the only way that they can get that exemption is if they are also ensuring that other sexual rules, let's assume sexual rules that they actually can find without privacy issues, but would they also have to just show that they are applying their other sexual rules equally? That's, uh, you know, I, I don't know. Um, I, I think that in theory, if someone wanted to challenge the sincerity of what they're doing, uh, you would put them on the stand and you'd ask them questions. And want, But I would think that those who are trying to say that it is not sincere would, uh, you know, that the kind, of the kind of evidence that you're saying I think would be relevant, whether it would actually carry the day, I don't know. Courts have been extraordinarily reluctant to say that people aren't sincere. Uh, there was a other case, than uh, other than prisoners, other than prisoners. I wasn't asking about sincerity. But that's how it comes up, I think. I mean, I think that's the only way in which it comes up. I mean, am I, you're the EOC commissioner. <laughs> Uh, how else would it come up? Well, the question is whether you're being a good Christian or a good Jew. And so the question is, are you just applying certain things about whether they're a good Christian or a good Jew? I mean, the thing yes. about Amos is you actually got a certificate. <laughs> you know what I mean? You got a certificate, and it was only four things. Did you tithe? Were you not smoking alcohol? Et Formally realizability. It was very right. helpful that the Mormons had a formally re realizable rule. Whereas, exactly. yeah. Well, it yeah. sounds to me like it's a variation of the question of whether Title VII lets you uh, provides accommodation just based on religion or religious tenets in some sense. You know, sort of how how you read religion and what that means for purposes of Title VII. But I think we have to read that in the context of at least the Amos case. Yeah, permitting permitting failure to comply with religious canons to be equivalent to failure to be a good Mormon. It wasn't just a Mormon, it was right. a good Mormon. No, oh, because he was Mormon. So well, that's, that's under, that was also in the church. I mean, well, well I know, yes. I, I think on this somewhat inconclusive <laughs> note, um, <laughs> we'll, we'll bring this session to a close. There are seven more panels scheduled over the next uh, <laughs> day and a half, so there'll be ample room to explore other opportunities. I think we, we do have a reception uh, yes, do. next door yes. if, uh, uh, for everyone attending. And we reconvene tomorrow morning in a, in a, in a nearby room, not this room, a nearby room yes. here at, at 9.15. I'd like to just thank the panelists again for doing such a wonderful job. Here.